When with their ships they bridge the sacred coast of Artemis, who wields a sword of gold, with Kynosura by the sea, in madness from their hopes after sacking lustrous Athens, just as the divine will then smother mighty Greece, ravenous son of hubris, raging in his lust, he thinks to drink and swallow all. Bronze against bronze will then engage closely, and Ares will color the open sea red. At that time will Hellas see the day of its freedom, brought by far-seeing Cronides and the Lady of Victory. Herodotus, quoting the prophecy of an oracle. Ahoy crew, welcome back to the Maritime History Podcast. I'm Brandon Hubner today, bringing you episode 38, our look at the naval battle of Salamis. Before we jump into the substance of our discussion, I would like to briefly direct your attention to this word from a fellow podcaster. Hello, fellow Maritime History fans. I'm Lantern Jack, host of the Ancient Greece Declassified podcast. What I love about Brandon's show is that it makes you realize how essential the sea was in shaping the course of ancient Greek history. Now besides the sea, there were of course other factors that drove the extremely rapid development of Greek civilization. I mean, just think of how from 800 BC to 100 BC, the Greeks went from being illiterate shepherds to the builders of astronomical calculators, steam-powered devices, and the biggest library the world would see until modern times. My podcast is dedicated to understanding why this rapid change occurred, and I do that by interviewing world-class experts in ancient history, archaeology, philosophy, and science. If any of this piques your interest, check out Ancient Greece Declassified wherever you get your podcasts. And now, enjoy your feature presentation. Great stuff there, and do check out his show if you feel so inclined. You can easily even just subscribe while this episode is ongoing, and then Lantern Jack's fine work will be in your queue waiting for you to pick up whenever you so wish. I have also dropped a link to his website in our show notes for today, just to cut down on your excuses about why you haven't checked out his show. A final word from me here to let you know that I'm planning to drop a supplemental episode not long after this one goes live, which will contain some thoughts on the podcast overall, our status, also why it's been pretty radio silent for much of the year 2019, and what my hopes and goals for the podcast are going forward into 2020 and beyond. Do look for that if you're curious. Otherwise, let's get started. Right off the bat here, it's worth stating that Salamis is one of the foremost naval battles of all history, really. It's widely covered in many different formats, and it has been for centuries, so I'm almost certainly not going to bring anything new to the table here today. My aim is to do justice to the battle, both in our coverage of the tactics and the specifics also in the framing of the greater significance of the battle to the Greco-Persian Wars, and then in turn in the development of Greek history in the broader scope. A lot of historians tie these aspects to the even wider lens developments of European history, um, at least culturally speaking, since the Greeks did play such a large role in the early stages of Europe as it's commonly viewed today. There is a pretty good argument to be made that the place of Salamis should be very high in the development of world history. It can be viewed as a watershed moment or a turning point in world history. We will get into that all before we're said and done with the battle, with this season of the podcast, and with this period of Greek history. For now, though, let's just get the ball rolling set the scene for our discussion today. We have jumped forward in time from when we last were with the fleets of Greece and Persia respectively after their conflict at Artemisium. Now let's join a meeting of two leaders aboard a ship in the harbor at Salamis. I think it's a safe bet that the name Themistocles is familiar to you by now. 
Let's join him aboard a Greek trireme in Salamis Harbor. The ship is beached there. Triremes were typically pulled ashore to dry out as space and time allowed. On this ship, Themistocles sits on the deck. It's a trireme, as we said. It belongs to Sparta, of all the city-states, which is a bit surprising, I guess, but Sparta did have some ships. Now, Themistocles isn't alone on the deck of this Spartan trireme. Also there, he's joined by the actual commander of the allied Greek forces, a man named Eurybiades. We've mentioned him a few times, but his name hasn't come up nearly as often as has the name of Themistocles. This meeting of the two major leaders of the Greek resistance wasn't a happy meeting. It was pretty far from it, actually. It's what we could call a crisis meeting. I think that's a pretty fair characterization, at least. This meeting's happening late at night, and Themistocles is the one who requested the meeting, basically. He's here at work once again to try and direct the course of events toward the end that he prefers. Being the skilled operator that we've come to know and maybe love, is the outcome really in doubt? I don't think it is, but, you know, we'll keep going with the story. Themistocles is on this deck of the Spartan trireme talking with Eurybiades, and this isn't his preferred option. It's probably not even, you know, his second or third fallback option. He's here almost as a final resort, and it's not his first meeting of the day either. Earlier in the day, the commanders of all the Greek forces had been meeting and they were attempting to hammer out an agreement about which next steps to take in the wake of their victory at Artemisium. We can't really call it a full-fledged victory, but it was a laudable showing for the Greeks, and it was one that seriously hampered the Persian progress in their campaign to that point. To get the full details about Artemisium, do go back and listen to the previous two episodes of the podcast here, if you haven't already, in those episodes we covered the naval engagement at Artemisium in very full detail. Nevertheless, the Greek forces were now meeting to try and decide what to do after that conflict at Artemisium. In the time between their battle there and this meeting at Salamis that we're now dropping into, the Greek navy had left Artemisium and they had sailed back to the surrounding region of Athens. The short version is that once they got back to Athens, they elected to evacuate the city. Across a narrow strait from Athens and her harbors lies the island of Salamis. This island is where the Greek fleet was now stationed, but the women and children of the city of Athens and the surrounding regions, they had all evacuated to Troizen, which is a city a little further to the southwest, and located on the Peloponnese. There's a lot that could be said about the specifics of this evacuation. There's been a lot of research done about um, something called the Decree of Themistocles and some other related matters. Perhaps I'll spend a small amount of time on a member episode talking about those topics. I did a bit of reading on them, but honestly it's a bit esoteric for my preferences about where sh we should be focused on this episode right now. There is enough to cover as it is, so we'll keep moving. With the women and children at Troizen and many of the Athenian allies having homes on the Peloponnese themselves, a healthy portion of the allied Greeks wanted to make a stand at the Isthmus of Corinth. They felt that this location presented the navy with a better opportunity to work alongside the army and to try and make a joint effort to keep the Persians out of the Peloponnese. After the Persian victory over Leonidas at Thermopylae, a few Greeks had begun building a wall across the Isthmus of Corinth. Their goal was to try and keep out the Persian army. They were the ones basically then lobbying for the Greek fleet and the army to make a stand at Corinth. 
they were lobbying to almost run a reboot of the coordinated stand that the forces made at Thermopylae and at Artemisium, as we've talked about already. This reboot would have the same cast, would have a similar plot, different setting, but, you know, a lot of the broad strokes were the same, if you follow what I'm trying to say here. The Greeks lobbying for this approach felt that they were destined to be defeated by the larger Persian navy. They didn't think that they could keep getting lucky against the odds they had been facing. They felt that fighting at the Isthmus would um, bring them closer to the Peloponnese, and by being closer, it would allow them at least a greater chance to escape after they were defeated, rather than to have their whole fleet and army wholly annihilated, which would end the war entirely then and there. They wanted to make a stand, give themselves the greatest chance they could, but also give themselves an out. The problem with this plan, though, as Themistocles saw it, was that it would leave all of Attica just freely open to Persia, with no resistance even attempted. As you might imagine, he was not on board with this plan. There are some other flaws that he outlined, and we'll cover those here momentarily. Rather than rehash the whole debate that was had between Themistocles' camp and those who wanted to fight at Corinth, I'll sum it up with this quote taken from Barry Strauss, who wrote that the Greek naval leadership at this first meeting at Salamis was comprised of, quote, admirals who cordially hated each other. That being the case, it was a long shot that they would have arrived at any kind of compromise to begin with. But as they were all assembled at Salamis, they were debating their various positions. A messenger entered the council, and he exclaimed news that Xerxes and his forces had entered the city of Athens, set the city aflame, and taken control of the Acropolis. At this meeting of the Greek leaders, chaos ensued, bluntly said. Despite the fact that this assemblage of naval leaders was on an island off the coast of Attica, also they had their entire naval force effectively at the ready there with them. They heard this news about Xerxes sacking Athens, and they just freaked out. They then scattered from the meeting. Some of them hopped on their ships and made a break for it. The remainder of the generals attempted to pass a motion to fight the Persians at the Isthmus, which we outlined a moment ago. They just ignored the rest of the generals present who still voiced dissent for this plan. I don't think this motion would have passed under whatever rules that they had set up for the assembly, but regardless, Herodotus tells us that the meeting ended in chaos. At that moment, Themistocles must have thought that matters had finally slipped from his grasp. Before, though, he gave up once and for all, Themistocles marched to the ship where Eurybiades was either resting or was himself preparing to vacate Salamis, and it was here that he demanded a face-to-face. -face. So we will rejoin Themistocles and Eurybiades aboard the Spartan trireme in Salamis Harbor, knowing that they had both come from the debacle that was the meeting of the Greek leaders. At this point, I want to read a translation of what Herodotus has Themistocles say during his meeting with Eurybiades, just because it gives us the most complete picture of how Themistocles framed his argument to the Spartan commander. Here, then, is essentially what he argued. Quote, If they, the Greeks at Salamis, launch their ships to sail away from Salamis, you can be sure that there will no longer be a united fatherland to fight for at sea, because each man will turn to his own city, and you will not be able to hold them back, nor will anyone else in the world be able to prevent the army from scattering completely. Hellas will be destroyed by this bad council. The essence of what Themistocles is arguing here is for unity. He's saying as soon as the council scattered in their chaotic reaction to the news that Athens was being burned, 
Themistocles foresaw that it would be every city for itself if they did indeed just scatter from Salamis. Now, Eurybiades, as the Spartan commander, he did have some self-interest in trying to keep the fleet unified. He was the official leader, and his reputation would probably rise or fall based on how Greece fared against Persia. Themistocles had also already established his reputation as the preeminent sea power thinker of Greece, so perhaps Eurybiades was convinced by other, more tactical arguments that may have also been laid out during this talk with Themistocles. Ultimately, the Athenian politician and naval commander convinced his Spartan counterpart to reconvene the Council of Commanders so that, hopefully, a more level-headed consensus could be reached. Thus, in the dead of that Greek night, the commanders reconvened. Some of them were maybe embarrassed by their earlier histrionics, although some of them I'm sure didn't care at all, and they were still vying to get away from Salamis as fast as they could. Do go read Herodotus for yourself if you are interested. It'll give you a great flavor of the back-and-forth witticisms that Themistocles and some of the other participants at this gathering tossed back and forth. Herodotus always does a great job of bringing these types of scenes to life. The main focus of the debate centered on Themistocles trying to convince his Greek brethren to stay at Salamis and to put up a fight. However, he didn't outline the same argument that he'd made earlier to Eurybiades, the one where he said that the Greeks would lose their unity if they all fled Salamis. No, instead of arguing against the negative result there, which is an argument that indirectly implies that the other leaders are cowards, by the way, no, when he was faced with the entire group once again, he took a slightly more positive angle of approach. He pointed out all the advantages that the Greeks would enjoy if they chose to make their stand at Salamis and in the straits there. Of course, he did have to point out a few of the negatives in order to compare and contrast the two options, so let's take a moment to do the same. We'll start with the option that almost happened when everyone fled the first meeting, their plan of fleeing to the Isthmus of Corinth and putting up a fight over there. In the view of Themistocles, doing this would have brought disaster. His argument was that the Greek fleet would be crushed, since the fighting grounds at the Isthmus there were just open water, there were no close confines where they could hope to stand against a foe with superior numbers. In addition, if the fleet and the army retreated to Corinth, then they were likely to be defeated at sea, and in so doing, by fleeing, they would have just given up Salamis, Aegina, all the other regions around there, and they would have given those up with not even putting up a fight. The Persian army would simply march to Corinth, force the confrontation there. If the Greeks didn't just scatter to their respective cities first, that was. In leading the Persians straight to Corinth, they would have left themselves with a do-or-die scenario, where the Peloponnese was on the line. Now, the contrast, which... This is the case that Themistocles made for staying to fight at Salamis. Really, his argument was a simple one, resting on the main point that at Salamis, the Greek fleet would hold an advantage, something that was crucial for them given that they were still outnumbered. Salamis presented narrow confines in which to engage the Persians, so Greece could again control the space and hope to again control the timing of battle as much as possible, like we saw at Artemisium. The Greek ships, we know from ancient sources, were heavier than the Persian ships, so the effectiveness of heavy ships in close confines was again a factor. Themistocles concluded his argument by reminding the group that the forces were already at Salamis, and that they all had something crucial to fight for, regardless of the city from which they hailed. By making a stand at Salamis, they would retain as much of their homeland as was still possible at that stage, 
and they could easily prevent a Persian assault on the Peloponnese by just stopping them here at Salamis. If they failed, they still had time to make a organized retreat and to see what happened from there. How did the reassembled leaders react to the argument from Themistocles? Well, the ones who were most opposed were also the most vocal. Imagine that. Adimantos was the commander from Corinth. Um, he was one of the main leaders pushing to fight at the Isthmus there. He had already interrupted Themistocles once in the second debate here, and when the speech was nearing its conclusion, Adimantos broke in again, and he said effectively, Themistocles, since you don't have a homeland left, Athens had been sacked by Persia, and since a man without a city shouldn't even be allowed to propose solutions anymore, just shut up, Themistocles. The response from Themistocles was a pretty severe one, understandably so, given that Athens had sacrificed so much to this point, and um, that Corinth basically was ignoring all of the sacrifice and you know, positive attributes that Athens had brought to the table. Athens was easily the greatest contributor of naval force to the Greek cause, by far. We've previously discussed her contribution of ships and naval manpower at Artemisium and at other engagements. Themistocles pulled no punches in his response by cutting straight to the heart of the matter reminding the gathering that the presence or absence of Athenian ships at any coming engagement would likely prove decisive. Herodotus sums it up like this, quote, Themistocles replied at length and with venom, declaring that in fact the Athenian's city and land were greater than that of Corinth, as long as they had two hundred ships of their own, fully manned for none of the Hellenes could repulse them if they were to launch an assault. The parting shot with which Themistocles concluded his speech is the most interesting aspect to me in all of this, because it's perhaps what forced the rest of the Greek commanders to give in to his plans. It may have simply been a bluff, we can't really know for sure, but if that's what it was, then no one called it. Here's the bluff in the words of Themistocles again. Quote, now if you refuse to do as I say, we shall pick up and leave with our families, and without further ado, go off to Cyrus in Italy, which is still ours from ancient times, and which the prophecies say we are destined to colonize. Then, when you find yourself alone without allies like us, you will remember my words. Some historians have viewed this threat by Themistocles as being just a bluff, which it may have been, but it just as well may have been a legitimate threat, which he was willing to carry out. And I personally tend to think that the Athenian plan, if the rest of the Greeks had chosen to scatter, their plan probably was to settle a colony in the West. Remember back to episode 29 where we talked a bit about the Ionian Greek city of Phacaea. You might recall, we wound up discussing how Cyrus the Great sacked the city of Phacaea in the 6th century BCE, and how the Phacaeans chose to pack up as much as they could and simply sail away to resettle their city. Or they attempted to do so, at least, in the Sardinian Sea, where they had previously settled colonies on Corsica. Of course, they came into conflict with the Phoenicians, who had also set up colonies in that region, but it seems entirely believable to me, based on this previous history from another Greek city, that when faced with the destruction of Athens, the Athenians and Themistocles may really have been willing to do the same thing, to go west and set up a new colony given the Persian takeover. Greece had a centuries-long tradition of colonization to this point, and Athens may have just followed suit. Ultimately, we can't know for sure, since this threat had the intended effect that Themistocles was hoping. Whether Adimantos and Corinth bought the bluff, it seems that Eurybiades, the Spartan commander, bought it enough 
that he resolved to make the final Greek stand there at Salamis. Maybe he was the only one that Themistocles was aiming to sway, but it worked. It appears that maybe as the overall commander, Eurybiades might have had power to make this decision binding on the rest of the Greek commanders, but the technical specifics of their command structure isn't super clear in the historical record that has come down to us. Nevertheless, it was here then decided, finally. Greece would stand and fight at Salamis as best they could. Or would they? We'll see as we keep moving today, but let's go ahead now and shift across the Straits of Salamis to consider the other side. So far we've spent all of our time in the Greek camp, witnessing their discord and their ultimate decision. But let's not overlook the Persian camp any longer. We'll shift our focus over to Phaleron, where the ships of Xerxes' navy are beached, and where the king's generals were themselves assembled and sharing their thoughts about whether Persia should give battle to the Greeks or instead alter its own strategy. Now, Xerxes partially deigned himself to appear amidst his armed forces, but in Persia's version of a war council, Xerxes didn't ask any questions. No, he sat silently with his greatest generals aligned before him, while Mardonius, his chief advisor, asked all the questions. Another difference in comparison to the Greek council is also clear, and that is that the Persian forces didn't seek to reach any kind of consensus. Instead, Xerxes asked his generals to share their thoughts about whether to give battle or to alter their war plans. But realistically, every general there knew what answer was expected from him. You might be able to guess the answer that Xerxes was expecting to hear, and consequently, the answer that pretty much every general there gave. Xerxes had, of course, amassed his forces. They had marched and navigated all the way to Athens. And now, with the campaigning season quickly nearing its end, Xerxes himself was present at Phaleron. All these signs point toward his desire to finish the Greek navy then and there. So, this is what his generals proposed. All except one, at least in the presentation that Herodotus has handed us, there was one general who dissented from all the rest. Here now is our cue to talk about one of the most intriguing elements present in how Herodotus describes the Battle of Salamis. The historiography of what Herodotus included and why he included it is a rabbit hole all its own. It's not one that I have plumbed too deeply myself yet, but um, one point here bears making. Now, Herodotus, the man who wrote the histories which covers the Greco-Persian Wars and some other related topics, he was born four years before the Battle of Salamis occurred. He was born in Halicarnassus, which is a Greek city, Carian Greek city, in Anatolia. By the time he began writing his histories, the events of Salamis and the Persian War, they had long since passed, and Halicarnassus was no longer subordinate to the Persian Empire. But, because Halicarnassus fought with Xerxes, on the side of Xerxes, I should clarify, and because the city had done so, barely within the lifetime of Herodotus. We can see an explanation here about why he might have included more detail about the leader of Halicarnassus and how she contributed to the war on the side of Persia. Herodotus was just more intimately connected with her story and with the city's role in the war. Perhaps these ties can help explain why Herodotus framed the contributions and the importance of Queen Artemisia the way that he did. But, you know, that's a slightly different discussion, and it would, again, send us off on a tangent, I think. Queen Artemisia was the ruler of Halicarnassus during the time of the Greco-Persian Wars, and is particularly at the Battle of Salamis. So let's go ahead and meet her now, and see her contribution to the Persian War Council at Phaleron. 
When Herodotus first introduces her part in the narrative, he does recognize that she is the only subordinate commander among the Persian forces that he's really paying any single focus to. If we look at this from a historian's standpoint, it is, you know, a positive point in the favor of Herodotus that he at least acknowledges the fact that he is a writer of history and that he's placing his personal bias, his personal emphasis on this element, and he's letting us know. He's at least paying lip service to his effort to objectively analyze and describe the past. And that's really one of the bigger reasons why he is called the father of history many times. So then Herodotus states right off that his inclusion of Artemisia was because, quote, he found it absolutely amazing that she, a woman, should join the expedition against Hellas. Okay, I, I think what he's driving at here is not so much that he finds it amazing that a woman is capable of doing these things, rather that it is fairly abnormal to see a female naval leader, especially one in a massive campaign at this point in the ancient world. There are many examples of female political rulers in the ancient world, and at this point Artemisia was the ruler of Halicarnassus. She took over the tyranny of the city after her husband died. As I said though, the more remarkable element here was that she was a female naval commander also. There are even female military leaders more generally that we can see in various times and places, stretching even to ancient times. But for some reason that I would like to try to flesh out as the podcast creeps forward, navies throughout history, they've been particularly under the leadership of male figures only. I'm not going to theorize too much here yet since I honestly I haven't been able to study it out yet. But it's something I've noticed, I think it's worth noting for us, and I'm curious if any of you have thoughts on why there are so few female naval leaders in history. Maybe some of you have studied it out yourselves. Um, but as I said, we'll see if we can fill in some of the picture as we move forward. To get back to our point today, though, Artemisia led Helicarnassus. And when Xerxes assembled his forces to assault Greece, she provided and commanded five ships. Herodotus says that these five ships were the most highly esteemed of the Greek ships who fought on the side of Persia. But even more remarkable is that, quote, of all the counsel offered to the king by the allies, Artemisia's was the best. This brings us back around to the military council that Xerxes ordered in the Persian camp at Phaleron. While he called for the input of his generals, we said a moment ago that he really was just looking for confirmation of his already made decision, and almost all of the generals obliged by playing the role of yes-men. Artemisia seems to have taken a different tack on the advice that she proffered to Xerxes. And we can surmise that this is one of the reasons that Herodotus includes her in his history. While every man around her nodded in agreement with Xerxes' plan to give battle to the Greeks at Salamis, Artemisia shared a much more level-headed assessment, one that Xerxes would have done well to heed. Hindsight is twenty twenty, though, as we have already seen time and again, and as we will continue to see as we move forward in history. For now, though, here's a summation of the advice that Artemisia gave, taken once again from the pages of Herodotus. He says that her advice was the following, quote, Here is what I think you should do, Xerxes. Spare your fleet. Do not wage battle at sea. For their men surpass yours in strength at sea. And why is it necessary for you to risk another sea battle? Do you not already hold Athens, the very reason for which you set out on this campaign? If you do not rush into waging a sea battle, but instead wait and keep your ships near land, or even if you advance to the Peloponnese, 
Then, my lord, you will easily achieve what you intend by coming here. The Hellenes are incapable of holding out against you for very long. You will scatter them, and each one will flee to his own city. For I hear that they have no food with them on this island, and if you lead your army to the Peloponnese, it is unlikely that those who came from here will remain where they are now and concern themselves with fighting at sea for the Athenians. Before we move on here, it's worth noting how similar Artemisia's advice here was to the arguments that Themistocles gave in favor of fighting at Salamis. Artemisia cogently saw the weaknesses that um, Greece had and how Xerxes could exploit them, how he could basically force the Greeks to scatter and to lose their unity. On top of this, though, Artemisia wasn't even done predicting the future. She continued, quote, But if you rush into a sea battle immediately, I fear that your fleet will be badly mauled, which would cause the ruin of your land army as well. Then, to wrap things up here, she takes a dig at the naval contributions of other cultures into Xerxes' navy. She said that Xerxes had the worst slaves or subjects, quote, namely the Egyptians, Cyprians, Cilicians, and Pamphylians. They are absolutely worthless. It's right here that I feel like saying, and mic drop Artemisia. It's a near certainty that there was total silence in the assembly after her mic drop there, especially since Herodotus tells us that all the other commanders expected Xerxes to punish her for broadcasting an opinion that opposed his own. In a surprise twist, Xerxes actually thought even more highly of Artemisia than he had done before, and this is because her argument was honest and it was well-reasoned. But even this wasn't enough to sway his opinion, and, well, the battle at Salamis was now officially on. Herodotus says that Xerxes actually based his decision to make battle at Salamis on the simple fact that he wasn't personally present at the naval battle of Artemisium. Apparently Xerxes thought that his navy fought like cowards because he wasn't there to oversee them. He was instead over at Thermopylae, where his land forces did actually win. Xerxes thought that him being present was the only thing that decided whether his forces won or lost. A quick assessment of the advice that Artemisia shared is worthwhile here, I think. As we said, it very closely tracked with the arguments that Themistocles made, and her advice to Xerxes was just solid all the way through. She was correct that the Greeks were on the verge of scattering, and that any shift in the land campaign would have probably forced them to split up to defend their individual cities. Similarly, the Greeks did hold an advantage in any sea battle at Salamis, thanks to their superior tactics and strategy. But Artemisia does overlook a third option that the Persians could have taken, and this is one that the Greeks almost tried to force to happen of their own accord. As we saw, Themistocles avoided this scenario by forcing them to debate once again, we'll see how that plays out as we keep going. The third option that Xerxes could have tried to force was the combined land and sea engagements at the Isthmus of Corinth. Um, we already talked about the details there. If he would have forced these engagements here by moving his army to Corinth and then moving his navy there also, the navy of Greece would have been at a decided disadvantage because the waters were open and Xerxes still largely outnumbered the Greek fleet. The Persians may have been able to force an engagement there if they had attempted to, but the impatience of Xerxes got the better of him, and, well, as we said, Themistocles had convinced his fellow Greeks to stick around at Salamis anyways. Of course, the actual and moment-by-moment -moment timeline leading up to this momentous battle it's one that we don't have actual access to. Various modern historians have fashioned their own narratives to give the words of Herodotus 
a cohesive and satisfyingly dramatic arc. But rather than fashion my own educated guess of a narrative, which I think that's the best that we can do really, there are too many holes in the historical record as we have it, I would just like to move forward to the next event for which we have solid footing. We said that the Greeks and the Persians each had their own councils, and based on some connect-the-dots analysis from Herodotus, it seems that these councils weren't happening at precisely the same time. The several debates among the Greeks may have been scattered over a few days, because we read that after Artemisia shared her council, and Xerxes ignored it, that he ordered the Persian fleet to prepare and put to sea. The problem was that the day was late, daylight hours were running out, so the Persian fleet formed their battle lines and sailed towards Salamis, but because it was almost dark at that point, they had no intention of actually giving battle that day. They were just preparing and organizing for the real assault that they planned to launch the following morning. But we've witnessed how fidgety most of the Greek commanders already were, how desperate they were to bail on Salamis, so I bet you can foresee what's about to happen. Most of them assumed that Persia was closing in and that they had better flee so that they could sail west and defend their homes on the Peloponnese. The Persians had in fact started the army marching in that direction, so the Greek reaction wasn't altogether unreasonable. They thought that their homelands were under pressure and that they had to get there to put up a final defense. As we've said though, their chances of defending the Peloponnese by land were pretty slim, and even if they also brought the whole navy there, they probably would have been defeated pretty easily. The odds were immense. At this point, it's not entirely clear if Xerxes knew that the Greeks had decided to make a stand at Salamis or not. In fact, the opposite seems like it may have been the case. Despite the protestations of Artemisia, Xerxes had decided that he wanted to defeat the Greeks as they were camped at Salamis. So, the day waning, he ordered the navy to get ready and put to sea. That seems to be how it played out. He expected the Greeks to scatter once he saw the Persian ships in the water, even though they weren't actually planning to attack until the next day. He expected this because he had begun to receive word from some spies and probably from, you know, some other intelligence in the area. He'd received word that there was conflict and disagreement among the Greek commanders, which in fact there was. It's very possible that Xerxes hoped to make his life a lot easier by working some espionage magic like the Persians had managed back at the naval battle of Laude. We looked at that one back in episode 32. In that battle, the Persian king Darius managed to win a naval confrontation without even fighting. His spies managed to win the loyalty of Samos, which comprised a fair portion of the Greek fleet at that time and place. As the Persian and Greek lines were about to engage off Lade, the Samian ships peeled off and they just sailed away. They left Persia with an easy advantage, and Persia won the battle. It would make total sense that Xerxes was pushing to pull off a similar coup. He was probably trying to convince one or several of the Greek cities who were part of the Greek navy to defect to go over to the Persian side and to try and help throw the battle, increasing the odds in Persia's favor. It would stand to reason that Xerxes had been putting his espionage apparatus to work long before his war council at Phaleron, and although Herodotus doesn't ever say clearly, it seems like some of the wrangling, some of the debate between the Greek commanders in the Greek camp might have been aided by leaders who had been bought by Xerxes, but who had stayed in the Greek camp to try to influence the outcome of Greek decision-making there. That is just speculation. All we know for sure is that Xerxes did love the espionage game, as we see evidence from earlier in the war. 
That said, Themistocles was also a big believer in subterfuge himself. We've seen that too. So he had some tricks of his own to put in motion this night before the battle. It doesn't seem like Themistocles pulled out this last stop automatically. Rather, his Greek brethren on Salamis, they had seen this pseudo-pressure that Persia's fleet launched by just presenting themselves in the Salamis Strait as daylight waned. Um, They may have also gotten wind about the army marching toward Corinth. Even though they had decided to stay and fight at Salamis, well, I love the way that Plutarch describes their reaction once they learned about Persia's movements. He says that upon seeing Persia's fleet and hearing that Corinth was under threat, quote, the words of Themistocles ebbed out of their minds. Nay, they actually decided to withdraw from their position at Salamis in the night, and orders for the voyage were issued to the pilots. Well, as we kind of, you know, portrayed earlier, Themistocles thought that he had already won this argument at the second assembly. He convinced them all to fight at Salamis, and they had all seemingly agreed. So now that they decided to back out of that agreement, what was Themistocles to do? Well, take matters into his own hands, that's what. And we know by now that this is where Themistocles is really in his element. While the assembled Greeks were officially deciding to go back on any previous consensus, and to now flee Salamis under cover of night, Themistocles slipped out of the assembly and he pulled aside a man named Sicinus. All we know is this man's name, and that he was a servant or possibly a slave in the house of Themistocles. Sicinus was a highly trusted servant, tasked with looking after the sons of Themistocles. He was a padagogos which our modern word pedagogue comes from. Plutarch says that Sicinus was possibly of Persian ancestry and that he had come to the house of Themistocles after being captured and held as a prisoner of war. Nowhere else can we confirm this origin story, but it's entirely plausible based on what Themistocles asked him to take care of this night on Salamis. After they secretly met, if we were a proverbial fly on the wall, we would have witnessed Sicinus take a small boat, perhaps with one or two others to take rowing duty, and he slipped out into the harbor at Salamis, pointed toward Athens. We've alluded to the reality that Xerxes and Persia had many times relied on the defection of their enemies to help win the battle before it had even begun. And it's clear that Themistocles knew his enemy, even in the days before Sun Tzu. The days before Rage Against the Machine, for that matter, too, I guess. So Sicinus rode across the strait and right into the Persian camp. He must have known or been conversant in their language, and this is why some historians do believe that he was formerly a prisoner of war. Now, the message that he brought was this which we're quoting from Herodotus here again. Quote, I have been sent here by the commander of the Athenians without the knowledge of the other Hellenes, for he happens to favor the cause of the king and wants your side to prevail. I have come to tell you that the Hellenes are utterly terrified and are planning to flee, and that you now have the opportunity to perform the most glorious of all feats if you do not stand by and watch them escape. For they are in great disagreement with one another, and will not stand up to you. Indeed, you will see them fighting a naval battle against themselves, those favoring your side, opposing those who do not. Plutarch includes the closing remark here that, quote, Xerxes received this as a message of goodwill, and was delighted precisely as Themistocles planned, too. It is simply remarkable that he could have had his own personal conviction that Greece had only one chance of survival, which was by giving battle at Salamis, and that he could then bring that conviction to fruition 
despite being opposed by his own countrymen. That he did this all by playing the king of Persia like a fiddle was, I'm sure, just icing on the cake in his view. That is, of course, if we accept the story as it has come down, mainly in the words of Herodotus, but also Plutarch as we saw. It is noteworthy that both Herodotus and then Aeschylus, too, I should mention, who was a contemporary of the battle at Salamis, they both confirm most of these broad strokes. Now then, Xerxes bought the message of Sicinus, hook, line, and sinker. Since we've already established that Xerxes ignored the advice of Artemisia and was instead eager to crush the Greek fleet at Salamis, this reaction to the message sent by Themistocles isn't entirely surprising. He was looking for that final indication that he could give the final command, and then Themistocles presented it to him on a platter. Xerxes didn't really question anything, it, it seems. After hearing the message from Sicinus, Xerxes did then give that final command for the Persian navy to board their ships and prepare to prevent the Greek escape in full this time. They weren't simply preparing to faint and try to throw off the Greeks. The timeline, as I've said, is fuzzy. It's possible that they made that faint preparation after Sicinus brought his word to the camp, the historical record gets a little fuzzy, and like I've said, various historians kind of depict the timeline different ways, depending on how they want it to look for their narrative. Now, timeline aside, the way that Themistocles framed and presented his message, it gave Xerxes the idea that he had to surround the Greek navy in order to close off all possible routes of escape. There's a surprisingly robust debate among historians about the technicalities involved here. It's another rabbit hole that I fell down fairly deep while reading to prepare the episode today. The boiled down version of the debate centers on a remark made by Herodotus, and that remark says that a portion of the Persian fleet was sent to encircle the island of Salamis to try to stop her up the strait on the western side of the island just as a safeguard to make sure that the Greek fleet couldn't escape that direction, even if they managed to slip up around Salamis and evade the main Persian fleet. The historical debate still exists because it seems implausible for a portion of Persia's ships to, one, have reached a choke point that far on the other side of the island within the time frame that we have to work with, but two, it's unclear from the later description of the battle that any contingents were actually even missing from the Persian and Greek lines. I lean toward an interpretation of events um, personally, which keeps all of these ships from both Greece and Persia present at the Straits of Salamis on the eastern side of the island. They all seem to have been fighting on the same scene of battle then. But this alternative view that there were contingents from both sides going to block off the other side of the island, it's worth noting because there is disagreement on this point. What appears to have happened after Sicinus brought his message and Xerxes decided to try to cut off all Greek escape, it seems that the Persian fleet put to sea as quietly as they could and that they stealthily tried to close the Greek harbor at and around the site of Salamis town on the island. There was an even smaller island just to the south of the harbor that the Persians also landed troops on, and they had some ships which plugged up the gap between this island and the bigger island of Salamis. The Persian ships were so numerous that only a fraction could fit into the actual strait, and area around the immediate harbor of Salamis, there seemed to have been a healthy portion of ships that were to the south and east, slightly blocking the space near and around the smaller island to help prevent the breakout of Greek ships that Xerxes so clearly thought was coming. 
concerning the timing of Persia's fleet and their preparation and launch. This all occurred in the dead of night after Sicanus brought his message that swayed the mind of Xerxes. And, you know, I've alluded to the thinness of the historical evidence for a timeline. There are a few lines in the poem by Aeschylus that allude to Persia putting to sea secretly in the night. So we'll go with that, I guess. The timing does kind of make sense, but Herodotus himself doesn't allude to any secret or stealthy preparation to surround Salamis done under the cover of darkness. What Herodotus does mention is how the Greek assembly did finally learn about Persia's movements. And again, if this were a scene in a drama or a depiction of the battle, I don't think it could have been, you know, done any better. The more time I spend with Herodotus, uh, the more I come to enjoy him and understand why he's viewed as the man who gave narrative history legs. So then, as the Persian fleet assembled itself into three lines of ships deep, that's another nugget that Aeschylus includes, actually, the three deep formation, but the Persian ships quietly glided across the strait to enclose the harbor and the surrounding environs at Salamis. The Greek commanders still debated the decision on whether to stay and fight or to abandon Salamis. But it seems that the Peloponnesian contingent had finally convinced everyone else to flee once and for all, to put up a fight at the Isthmus of Corinth. As this debate was raging, of course, Sicanus put forth secretly and rode to the Persian camp. Themistocles, of course, had sent his spy into the Persian camp to share the misleading information, which spurred the Persians to action. Right at this moment, from stage left, as it were, a player enters. Re-enters, really. He's a man who was a major player at one time, on the Greek political stage, but we haven't really talked about him yet that much. The man was Aristides. He was the political nemesis of Themistocles in Athens for quite some time before Aristides was exiled from the city um, a couple of years prior to 480. The simple significance of his reappearing on the stage is that prior to his exile, he was known throughout Athens as the politician synonymous with honor, justice, fairness, and truth, such as it exists in politics anyway. Themistocles, as we've seen, he was known more as a schemer, a cunning operator. So Aristides appears back in Salamis at this opportune moment, and he bears news that confirms the success of Themistocles' scheming, but he can also present this news to the assembly and use his clout to try and reunify the Greek forces. Before he reappears in Salamis here, Aristides had been coming from the island of Aegina, the nearby island, where he'd been sent to retrieve some sacred artifacts and to bring them back to Salamis, hopefully to inspire the forces. He is returning to Salamis under cover of darkness, and we read that he barely skirts the enclosing lines of the Persian ships as they quietly try to block Salamis Harbor. This is the news that he brought to Themistocles. We are all surrounded, and there is no escape remaining now. I can't help but picture Themistocles being secretly thrilled at this news. Maybe he didn't show it outwardly. But given all his prior scheming and manipulating, he probably feared that the assembly would not believe him. They probably would call him a liar if he strode back in and said, um, It's great that you guys decided to run away, but too late now. You can't. We're surrounded. It seems like maybe nobody would believe him at this point. Everyone knew that he would be happy with this outcome, with being forced into a battle at Salamis. That being the case, it's pretty fitting that the Athenian champion of justice and honor and truth showed up right at that moment to be the one to break the news. 
who could doubt this news coming from the lips of Aristides. When he shared it, the significance of this news must have immediately sunk in to each of the Greek leaders. They now had no choice remaining but to stand and fight at Salamis. At this point, it's sometime deep into the night when they receive the news, and from here, they had to begin their preparation for battle. The Persian fleet, as we've seen, was already in formation, floating off the harbor in three lines deep, and at least for the Greeks, the Persians still thought that they had the drop on Greece. Greece, having learned that Persia was sitting there waiting, they now could give battle on their own timing. A few hours of sleep, probably, and a hearty meal may have been in the cards for the oarsmen and marines that manned each Greek ship. But after that few hours, in pre-dawn hours, they then must have all begun assembling at their respective ships, taking their assigned positions, climbing the ladders for what they hoped would not be their final sensation of feet upon solid ground. Sometime right before the break of dawn, Themistocles convened an assembly of the marines and the triarchs, exhorting them with a charge to choose the best in human nature, rather than the worst. And so, the Greek fleet, fully manned, began to leave the beaches of Salamis and row into formation to meet the force of Persia. What we read in Herodotus is that he doesn't elaborate at all on formation or tactics. He says just that they set sail and were immediately attacked by the barbarians. Aeschylus gives us a little more to work with, which I appreciate, especially since Aeschylus was himself present at the Battle of Salamis. The coloration that Herodotus lacks when it comes to this event at least, is very present in the Persians, which is the play that Aeschylus wrote following the conclusion of the war as a whole. I'm thinking that we might cover that play in a supplemental episode too, but we can continue to utilize portions of it here today since they are so instructive. So the Greek fleet began to leave their shore berths at or right before dawn, and given that their fleet was at this point around 380 strong, it would have taken them a bit of time to get into a workable formation. Still, they did manage to do so, and Aeschylus describes the moment where the ruse of Themistocles pays off, where the Greek fleet used the element of surprise to full and magnificent effect against the Persian fleet that still was expecting disorganized flight from the surrounded Hellenes. Here are a few lines from Aeschylus to kick off our look at the proper Battle of Salamis. He writes, Night advanced, but not by secret flight did Greece attempt to escape. The morn, all beauteous to behold, drawn by white steeds, bounds o'er the enlightened earth. At once, from every Greek with glad acclaim, burst forth the song of war, whose lofty notes the echo of the island rocks returned, spreading dismay through Persia's hosts, thus fallen from their high hopes. No flight this solemn strain portended, but deliberate valor bent on daring battle, while the trumpet's sound kindled the flames of war. But when the pain ended, their oars with impetuous force dashed the resounding surges. Instant all rushed on in view. It is at this stage that Aeschylus begins to outline the layout of the battle site and the forces that clashed in the Straits of Salamis, so it makes sense for us to do the same. At the risk of restating what was that pretty self-explanatory passage that we just read, Dawn was the moment when Xerxes and the Persians fully realized their mistake. Greece was not a bedraggled, disjointed, fleeing foe. Rather, she was a group of countrymen who finally decided to stand and fight for a common goal, 
knowing that this was their final chance to vanquish their larger foe from the Greek homeland. A battle pain, a song of war burst forth from the Greek line, and they forcefully rode within sight of Persia's ships, eager to give battle once and for all. Here is how the forces align themselves, and a bit of commentary about how they seem to have strategized for the battle. As has been a constant theme for us, the numbers on each side are debated. The Greek fleet was around 380 ships, which is a number that comes to us from Herodotus. Although his specific number varies depending on interpretation of his description and, you know, technicalities involved, most historians do actually put the number of Greece's ships between 370 and 380 at the Battle of Salamis. Aeschylus numbers the Greek fleet at 310 ships, and although Aeschylus was present at the battle, it's something we should remember that a single spectator on the level of the ships, perhaps even rowing or in the hold of one of the ships, he would not have been able to count the number present with any degree of accuracy, really. So commentaries tend to give the number from Herodotus a little bit more credence. The number does track based on some of the figures that we have seen from earlier in the war, as the Greeks suffered losses then through to Artemisium especially. How about the size of Persia's fleet? And, well, this is where things get even more contested. A ballpark ratio that is always used is three Persian ships to every one Greek ship. And as far as rough figures go, the ratio isn't altogether bad. Personally, I like to revise it down a little bit. Herodotus and Aeschylus both give us a figure of 1,207 ships in the Persian navy at the beginning of the war. Aeschylus uses this exact number for his figure of those ships present at Salamis too. But there are a lot of reasons to discount this figure, and I don't want to get too deeply into them. Herodotus mentions, as we've said, several storms leading up to this battle called the Persian fleet, and then the Persians lost ships at the Battle of Artemisium. They got some reinforcements between Artemisium and Salamis, but it seems conservatively their number was probably between 700 and 900 ships when they entered the Salamis Straits in their three rows to face the Greeks. That's still fairly close to the 3 to 1 ratio if we lean toward the high end at 900. If we're being conservative, it's possible that the ratio was near 2 to 1. The Greeks at 370, 380, the Persians between 750 and 850 maybe. Now, this doesn't discount the outcome that we're about to see unfold, but given that the accounts of this battle all come through Greek witnesses, we don't have a Persian record of what happened at the battle, well, that being the case, you can understand why the Greek sources might inflate their disadvantage a little bit. It would make the outcome all the more impressive. So Aeschylus recounts that on the morning of the battle, Xerxes himself had taken his royal throne and his entourage up on a high hill beside the broad sea, a place that scholars assume to have been the slopes of Mount Aegaleos on the mainland west of Athens, and I'm not sure I pronounced that right. It's a mountain that is west of Athens near the coast, and it would give a full view of the Strait of Salamis. If we were to take a peek at the daily planner of the great king that day, I feel like it would have had an entry something akin to bear witness to my great victory over the Hellenes, something like that, and he did have a front row seat. From his perspective, looking south-southwest toward the strait and toward the island and Salamis Harbor, he would have seen his ships arrayed in three lines, just as he had commanded that night before. 
Now, it seems that the default alignment of ships in battle was rooted in what land forces typically did during land battles. Because hoplites held their shields in their left hand and weapons in their right, the soldier on the right end of the line was considered to be the one in the position of honor, since he was unprotected by any other soldier's shield. The line would run down, and each soldier could utilize the cover of the shield held by the man to his right. So, in the line abreast formation for the ships, the Greek ships side by side probably stretched out along a line one and a half miles or so, and the ships on the extreme right end would have been considered in the position of honor, symbolically. Since the Spartans were technically in charge of the whole operation, Eurybiades was the leader, the Spartan ships then took the right flank of the Greek line. Traditionally for land forces, the next most honorable position was on the extreme left flank, so too in ship lines and sea battles, and on the left flank of the Greek line here, the bulk of the Greek fleet was made up by Athenian ships, and they would have made up almost one full half of the Greek ship forces, so the entire left line, almost from the middle down, was made up of Athenian ships. Corinth had a contingent of ships too, and we're not quite sure where they fit into the mix, beyond the obvious that they must have been between Athens and Sparta somewhere, so in the right center, somewhere toward that direction. Now, there is an idea that is propounded by a few scholars and that is mentioned in passing by Herodotus that Corinth and her ships had been tasked with being a decoy division, that near the beginning of the battle, they sailed away, pretending to flee Salamis through the channel and to sail away to the northwest and around the island. The idea here is that they would have deceived some of Persia's ships, Xerxes might have thought that his espionage had worked, and um, he would have sent a contingent of his ships to pick off Corinth, or perhaps he just let them go, and the flanking ships that some people theorize about had been sent to block them off that direction. Either way, this possible role of Corinth as a decoy, the idea is that they would have diverted a portion of Persia's strength. This theory is in no way agreed upon by most scholars, but there is a tradition in Greek histories that in the years after the Battle of Salamis, Athens and Corinth argued with one another about the role that Corinth played in the battle. I'm thinking that I will talk a little bit about that on a member episode. It shouldn't take a whole lot of time to cover. I just thought it was a bit too tangential today, and the consensus view is largely that Corinth probably was in the Greek line of battle, and that none of this decoy movements and fake-outs, they probably didn't come into play. There are reasons that they enter the historical record, we'll talk about that elsewhere. Right before we shift perspectives to look at the Persian line of battle, I do want to reiterate that the picture of Salamis that I'm presenting today is overall the consensus view. It's the traditional narrative about how the battle played out. In a footnote of his book Persian Fire, historian Tom Holland does note that the battle at Salamis is, quote, difficult to reconstruct based on the surviving sources, and that the literature is unsurprisingly vast. There are almost as many interpretations of what happened as there are historians who have written about it. And I can't help but agree with Mr. Holland here. It's uh, a very thoroughly covered battle with many various opinions and perspectives on every minute detail. So that's made it a little hard for me to actually kind of boil down to the consensus points and to form a narrative while also giving note at least to some of the dissenting views. So we've seen this dissenting and debate 
played out in just the narrow matter of us trying to figure out how many ships fought on each side during the battle, then factor in the nitty gritty of tactics, how fighting developed in the heat of battle, so forth. War is just a messy business, and the intricacies of what took place at a particular battle over 2,500 years ago make for a tough puzzle to try to assemble, not to mention the reality that we are missing pieces to the puzzle, and we're doing our best to estimate where those gaps exist. Nevertheless, I would like to try to cover the traditional view here and maybe tackle some of the other competing views on a different episode, although that also might be too much to ask for. It might be too confusing, so we'll see how that goes. That all said, I think we should discuss the Persian line of battle now. We said that the Persian fleet, as they formed up in the dead of night, long before the Greek ships had left their own shore, Persia's ships had taken up an order akin to how they probably were beached along the shores and harbor at Phaleron, outside Athens. The Phoenician ships were furthest west. The Egyptians and the assorted other small cultures that the Persian monolith had assimilated probably took up places in the center of the line. The Ionian and Greek city-states that had contributed their strength to Xerxes then formed the easternmost or left wing of the fleet from the Persian perspective, facing toward Salamis, southwest. It was here that Artemisia, with her handful of Halicarnassian ships, would have fit in, on the left end of the Persian line. Now, there's a similar issue related to the Egyptian contingent as there was concerning the Corinthian ships in the Greek line, and that is, none of the literature clearly states that Egypt's ships actually took part in the battle. We must assume that they did, because there's very little chance that they could have physically rowed around to the opposite side of Salamis Island, the way that Plutarch seems to imply, and the traditional account has just assumed that Egypt was present in the battle, but that Herodotus chose not to allude to them particularly. There are theories that Egypt may have been the one responsible for sending soldiers onto the nearby small island that Persia tried to gain control of. Maybe that's why Egypt wasn't really mentioned in the middle of the battle. It's really hard to say. What we do know is that once the battle lines formed and the ships began to gain some momentum, the Athenians and Phoenicians found themselves matched against one another on the western ends of their respective lines, while the Spartans and perhaps Corinthians wound up matched against their Ionian Greek brethren who fought on the eastern end of Persia's line. This is, of course, if the lines matched up perfectly, but the reality is that that probably didn't happen. The Greeks were rowing out of a fairly narrow harbor at Salamis, and the Persians had been waiting out in the straits for probably five or six hours at least by the time dawn broke and the Greek fleet began to form up for battle. The Persian forces, even if they were in a line three deep, would have stretched from the western edge of the harbor all the way to the extended tip of the Kynosura Peninsula, out beyond that toward the small island of Cytalia that we have mentioned. Um, they probably stretched around that island and to the south, stopping up the gap there. Do take a look at the map that I have whipped up for this episode. Um, I'm actually still working on it, so I might not have it ready to go immediately when this episode goes live but it will be shortly thereafter, at the latest. I hope the map presents a lay of the land, and um, probably should have mentioned it earlier, actually, when we were talking about the layout. There are other maps online, too, that can help give you an idea of the geography and the layout of the ship lines on each respective side. That all as it is, the Greek fleet was stretched to its limit. It was a single deep line, and it was facing against the three deep and probably much more extended Persian line of ships. Dawn breaks, 
and in the dramatic, traditional version of the story as Herodotus tells it, even more so in the dramatic words of Aeschylus that we read a moment ago, Dawn saw the Greek fleet row north with a hearty battle cry, and the sound of trumpets signifying a unified force with a single-minded goal, to vanquish the forces of the great king from their homeland. As we've said, this would have come as a shock to the Persian generals, since Xerxes and his forces only even moved into the straits during the preceding night because they expected a fleeing bunch of individual city-states, disunited and ripe for picking off. Had Xerxes heeded Artemisia and realized the potential risk that he was undertaking, he might have had second thoughts. Persia's weakest hand was the one that it played here at Salamis, but once the battle cry echoed across the water, there was no going back. Finally here, before the ships have engaged, I want to note perhaps the most crucial element in all of this. Thanks to the espionage that Themistocles pulled off, perhaps it's better to call it disinformation, uh, I'm not quite sure if that fits the job here, but because he planted false info with Xerxes and lured him to launch his ships into the strait the night before battle, hastily, I might add, if we take the ancient accounts at their word, the way it all played out then, the Persian ships had been holding position in the channel for at least six hours before the battle even started to get underway. It's unclear if the Persian forces really had a chance for a decent meal before they were forced to launch their ships, and due to the design and use of triremes and biremes, they couldn't just anchor in the harbor and wait for the Greeks to come out to meet them. The Persian oarsmen would have been stuck to their benches all night, hands on the oars, required to row just enough to keep the ships steady in the choppy waters between Salamis and the mainland. So, the lack of rest over the course of that entire night seems to have been a large factor in the battle, and that factor is going to now play out as they meet. The Greek forces, by contrast, they had a chance to eat breakfast, take their time, somewhat at least, and they even got some rest before they got ready for battle that morning. Last but not least, the Greek forces did also have the element of surprise on their side. Persia had been sleepily manning the oars, expecting a simple victory to end the war. They were greeted with the battle pain of Greece's finest sailors and warriors. And so we've finally arrived at the battle proper. I appreciate your patience in the build-up here. I'm a sucker for the details that are elsewhere left out of the mix, since I personally tend to think that those give us a picture with higher resolution as opposed to the bare or operative facts that um, typically are repeated in most places and those alone. So the simplest way to describe the early stage of this battle is that it was probably similar to what occurred at Artemisium as we looked at it last time. The whole Greek strategy rested on the exploitation of the narrow confines, and to do that even more effectively, they formed their battle line, advanced out a ways to draw the Persians to advance, but then Herodotus tells us most possibly all of the Greek ships backed water to tighten their line back up. They moved backward toward the shore from which they had just left. The idea here was that it would suck the Persians forward even further into the tightest possible space before Greece sprung the charge, so to speak. We've seen how the heavier Greek ships held an advantage when space was limited, but it also limited Persia's advantage in numbers to be fighting in the narrowest confines. Less space to maneuver, fewer ships that can even get involved to begin with. Persia's fleet was arranged in three lines, so it's questionable how many of Persia's ships would have even been involved during the early stages. Beyond the front line and perhaps the second line to clean up any Greek ships that had broken through, 
it's doubtful that the third line had any part to play in the early stages of this battle. If he had not been preparing to mop up a ragtag fleeing navy, maybe Xerxes would have arranged his ships differently for the battle. But once the fleets had sighted one another and reached the moment of engagement, rearranging the lines was out of the question. That moment had passed. So then, the Greek fleet backed water for a bit, likely to tighten up gaps and prevent a Persian breakthrough, but also to close down space and exploit the advantages they possessed. Leave it to one trierarch to break ranks, though. According to Herodotus, an Athenian ship, captained by Ammianius of Pallini, broke with the line, and he was the first ship to land a blow against Persia. No real detail has passed down to us about maneuvers or anything like that, only that this captain was the first one to ram a Persian ship. We do read that his ship got stuck in the pierced hull of its Persian target, and that the general battle was engaged when more Greek ships came out to help provide support. The danger of getting a ram stuck in the side of an enemy trireme was probably higher than you might suspect, and physics would suggest that ramming an enemy at an indirect angle probably increased the chances that an attacking ram would get stuck. A few rough calculations of the forces at play during a ramming maneuver have calculated that if an attacking ship managed to travel at 10 knots, Directly prior to landing the blow, the force of the impact on a direct strike would equal about one-third of the ship's weight, about 66 tons of force, according to Morrison and Coates. They claim that this amount of force would be enough to push a victim trireme a few meters sideways, while the attacking ship was slowed to a halt, they don't, however, believe that this force of the blow would have been enough to severely shock the entirety of the victim trireme. It probably would kill a handful of men who were in the immediate vicinity of the ram's impact spot. Then the true damage would occur due to water flooding in at the impact site, which would of course hinder the maneuverability of the ship that was struck afterwards if the strike was solid and not just a glancing blow. Attacking ships often did suffer damage to their own rams because of the forces that were acting on both ships, and if the attacking ship hit at an oblique angle, it could easily bend the ram of the attacking ship, making it less effective or entirely useless for future ramming maneuvers. So attacking ships if conditions allowed, probably tried to carry out perpendicular strikes, whenever possible, hitting straight on and not at an angle, since this would reduce the likelihood of damaging their own offensive weapon, their ship, and their ram. So what likely happened after the ram of Ammianius got stuck is a scene that I tend to think played out all across the watery site of the Battle of Salamis. It isn't quite what we think of when we read about ship engagements and ramming maneuvers, but trireme warfare at this stage was still, you know, at a somewhat early stage of its evolution as a whole, even though Salamis was at the tail end of the Persian War. The scene that probably occurred once the Athenian and Persian ships were stuck together is that ships became little more than floating platforms for archers to rain arrows down from one deck into the other. Boarding and hand-to-hand -hand combat probably also took place if the situation made that possible. Spears were probably hurled by marines into their opposite numbers on nearby ships. Many historians of this battle and others of the era tend to characterize the um, naval battles that played out as being naval battles in the early stages devolving into land warfare tactics on floating, somewhat mobile platforms 
especially as the sea lanes started to get clogged with sinking ships, debris. Mobility was probably high at the beginning, but it tended to decline rapidly as chaos quickly resulted, and there were long stretches where close combat occurred between the crews of opposing ships. Slowly, one side would begin to emerge victorious over the other, and then more room probably started to open up again eventually. Ships drifted apart, debris floated to one side or the other depending on current, and over time, it would become a cleanup operation for one of the sides. Before we get that far, though, let's follow the narrative of Herodotus after that first engagement by the gung-ho Ammianius. The general matchups within the overall battle were the ones that we laid out a while ago, but I will recap for clarity's sake. The Athenians were on the left end of Greece's line facing Phoenicia, who were arguably the most experienced among the ships fighting under Persia's banner. The Spartan ships, and probably Corinth as well, were on the eastern right end of the Greek line, and here they were matched up against their brethren who fought for Persia, the ships from various Ionian city-states that had pledged allegiance to Xerxes. On balance, Herodotus admits that he cannot say with great specificity how particular groups or ships fought and fared in the battle. There was just so much going on that no one man could bear witness to at all, especially a man like this writing years after the fact. He wrote, quote, I cannot speak with certainty about how each specific group of barbarians and Hellenes performed in the fighting. Surprisingly, though, he still has a lot to share about the queen who hailed from his own home city. So I guess we should now zoom in to see some details about Queen Artemisia, and then we can shift back to the battle again after this. I have to admit at this stage that I did finally break down and watch what I guess we can call a sequel to the first 300 movie. The second was called 300 Rise of an Empire. Now, I realize that these movies were based on a graphic novel or on a comic miniseries, I guess. I sought out the originals, the comic series, and I had a hard time overlooking the historical inaccuracies, but again, I'm sure that the creators of the comics and the movie in turn weren't just trying to be historically accurate. They approached it from a very specific angle, they were trying to emphasize certain elements, and they wanted to form a dramatic, concise story with a good narrative arc and plot. But to do so, they had to change a fair bit of what we read in the history books. I can't blame them, since we ultimately don't know a lot of what happened, since Herodotus doesn't share it all, and that he probably uh, exaggerated some elements in his narrative as well. Anyway, all of this is to say that the film adaption of the engagement at Salamis and the role that Artemisia played, they were a little bit much for my taste, but the visuals were pretty interesting to see, and um, at this point I'd like to discuss what Herodotus describes in his words and then see what may or may not have been within the realm of likelihood. So it seems that the descriptions of Artemisia's particular involvement didn't come into focus until at least the middle of the day of this battle, and at this time the tide of the battle itself had become a bit easier to decipher. Here are some lines from Aeschylus before we dive into particulars about Artemisia. Aeschylus writes, quote, The deep array of Persia at the first sustained the encounter, but their thronged numbers in the narrow seas confined want room for action. And deprived of mutual aid, beaks clash with beaks, and each breaks all the other's oars. With skill disposed, the Grecian navy circled them around with fierce assault, and rushing from its height, the inverted vessel sinks. The sea no more wears its accustomed aspect. 
with foul wrecks and blood disfigured, floating carcasses roll on the rocky shores. The poor remains of the barbaric armament to flight ply every oar and glorious. Onward rush the Greeks amid the ruins of the fleet, as through a shoal of fish caught in the net, spreading destruction. Amidst what essentially became this chaos of battle, Herodotus describes a specific scene that played out. It's one that he claimed Xerxes himself also witnessed from atop his high throne on the mountainside that abutted the sea and the site of the bloody battle in Salamis Strait. Theoretically, from this vantage high on the mountain, it would have been possible to spot specific ships from a bird's-eye view of the battle. It's thought that many ships carried banners or flags, other identifying features that would have borne unique color and design. Of course, I, I tend to be skeptical about some of these very particular details and stories, so I'm skeptical of this one, which is the idea that Xerxes and then Herodotus later on would have 100% accurate details of one specific event on this site of battle as it was playing out. But, you know, I, I guess it is possible, and it does amp up the drama. Herodotus recounts that as the battle descended into the chaos of scattered skirmish and individual ship conflict, Xerxes saw a ship from amongst his own forces, and he was impressed. The ship was none other than the flagship of those that were controlled by Artemisia, and it would seem that she was aboard the flagship, perhaps even commanding it. As the chaos of battle ensued, she found her ship under pursuit from an Athenian ship. Perhaps it had broken through Persia's line elsewhere and then wheeled back around to pursue other Persian ships from behind. It seems that this was the angle of attack, because Artemisia sought to escape the pursuit, but friendly ships, other Persian and Ionian ships, were surrounding in such close proximity that she had little room to maneuver. The effect of the Persian numbers is having a negative impact on them again here. Artemisia chose an avenue of escape that was, shall we say, a bit unconventional, but it did the trick. She apparently chose to ram a ship that was still fighting on the side of Persia. It was a ship from Anatolia that had strong connections to the Ionian Greek cities there. Herodotus is unclear on whether she did this out of pure selfish expediency, or if it was perhaps premeditated because she had a pre-existing quarrel with this city and chose an opportune moment to cause them a bit of damage. Either way, her move to purposefully lob some friendly fire actually worked. The attacking Athenian ship assumed that she was either friendly or was maybe defecting from Persia, and he peeled off, he abandoned his attack. This is kind of understandable. In the chaos of battle, this probably resulted in many incidents of friendly fire. If you see a ship attacking another one that you know for sure is with the enemy, then maybe you have to assume that the enemy of your enemy is your friend. Battle gets messy, basically. The reward that Artemisia reaped due to battlefield confusion here was double, though. So while the attacking Athenian assumed in one direction that Artemisia was on his side, Xerxes and his advisors assumed in a different direction somehow. They could clearly recognize Artemisia's ship from a distance because of her ensign and colors, so when they saw her ship deftly ramming and sinking another one, they just assumed that her victim had been an enemy Greek ship, who on earth would purposefully attack their own comrades, right? Herodotus concludes his account of Artemisia in this battle by explaining that this whole event is why she is noteworthy and why she came to great fortune following the battle. Apparently Xerxes saw this all and presumed that she was among the bravest of all the commanders who fought for him that day. 
he is famously quoted as having exclaimed, my men have become women and my women men. Now, overlooking the clearly sexist presumption behind that comment, um, it is too bad then for Xerxes that he did not have more female commanders amidst his ranks that day at Salamis. As the day wore on, it quickly became clear that the strategic plan of Themistocles was superior in every way. Despite Persia's numerical superiority, the Greeks again suckered them into an unideal situation, forcing them into a battle where their weaknesses were heavily exploited. We've already talked a fair bit about how the Greek ships outweighed the Persian ships on average, so the lack of space gave Greece an advantage there. We've also highlighted how the numerous ships in Persia's lines all vied for the same maneuvering space, and Herodotus again confirms that this was a running theme over the battle's course. Once the front line of Persian ships realized that they were being outfought, many of them attempted to turn and flee, perhaps with the idea that they would live to fight another day and try to seek a battle on more favorable terms elsewhere. That's well and great, and it probably would have been a good idea if the whole fleet had been thinking the same thing. But, thanks to the subterfuge of Themistocles and the difficulty of spreading information en masse during a battle like this, Persia's front line turned to flee, and it just ran straight into the two lines of ships that were supposed to be acting as support. Herodotus accounts some of this to the fact that Xerxes didn't necessarily foster unity within his fleet and within his armed forces. Rather, he made a habit of rewarding acts of individual valor and punishing individual acts of cowardice with death. Herodotus says that when the front line turned to flee, the rear lines tried to push to the front to show that they hadn't yet lost their nerve like their chicken comrades had in the front line. They knew that Xerxes was still sitting up on that mountainside watching. All intentions aside, space was still constricted, and the conflicting aims and motivations of the Persian lines just led to more destruction and pushed Persia further toward total defeat. Another contributing factor to the lack of unity among the Persian ranks, at least in comparison to their opponent, is seen in the reality that Persia's fleet was made up of ships and cultures from many different locales, many of which did not share a common language. This almost surely played a role in the fighting ability of the Persian fleet, and it's mentioned on several occasions by Herodotus during his account of the entire war, but he shares a scene here near the battle's conclusion that's rather telling on this point about disunity in the Persian naval fleet. It hinges on another battle scene that was supposedly witnessed by Xerxes from atop his mountainside perch. As this scene probably took place later on in the afternoon, after the battle had been going for a good six or eight hours, this scene involves ships from both Athens and Aegina. These two Greek cities had started with their ships on either end of the main battle line, so by the point of this story, enough shifting had occurred that they were now fighting in close proximity. Although, I guess Athens did have so many of the ships in the Greek navy that they probably took up half of the line and it might not have taken long before ships from the other cities were fighting close to Athenian ships. Anyways, we read that Xerxes witnessed a Samothracian ship from his navy ram a ship from Athens. As likely happened throughout the battle, the Samothracian ship was preoccupied. Perhaps the ram was still stuck in the flank of its victim. It was uh, distracted, and an Aegean ship closed in and rammed the Samothracian ship in reply. A one-two sequence. The Athenian ship apparently began to sink, and the ship from Samothrace began to do the same when it was struck 
but Xerxes then witnessed his subjects from Samothrace perform a feat to save their own lives and keep on fighting. They were javelin fighters, Herodotus says. So rather than take their chances in the water, they fought off their own sinking deck and they swept the Aegeanetans from their deck and they took over the Greek ship who had rammed them. I'm sure scenes like this occurred throughout the course of the battle. As we've said, hand-to-hand combat quickly became the default if ships were locked together or didn't have room to maneuver. Now, the disunity within Persia's forces comes into play here in this story. Xerxes was again still up on his throne, and a number of Phoenician commanders who had lost their ships but had either made it back to shore or were commanding from shore to begin with, they witnessed the course of battle, and they decided to hike the mountain, and they decided to cast the course of the day's battle and Persia's losing status on others among the Persian forces. The Phoenicians who marched up there claimed that it was the Ionian ships who caused the Phoenician ships to sink. If Ionia hadn't turned and fled and fouled the Persian lines, then the entire Persian navy would not be in the crisis that they now found themselves in. The Phoenicians went so far as to call the Ionians traitors. Now, unfortunately for them, while they were standing in the proximity of Xerxes casting these accusations, Xerxes witnessed the scene that we just described. Samothracian Ionian sailors and marines sank a ship from Athens. They then took control of a ship from Aegina by using their force of arms to fight from one deck onto the other to save themselves. Witnessing this feat, Xerxes ordered the Phoenician captains who were in his presence complaining, he ordered them executed, so that no one in his fleet would again slander captains who proved themselves better or braver. Maybe it was just bad timing on the Phoenicians' part, but as I said, the scene I think is somewhat telling as to the disunity among the Persian forces. Of course, in defeat, many and even great groups will fragment and turn to infighting, so this isn't altogether surprising. Cohesion does seem to have been an ongoing issue for the Persians, though, and it may have contributed to their poor showing at Salamis. Including the scene where the Samothracians prove brave and Xerxes executes the Phoenicians who slandered them, the narrative regarding the battle really turns into a series of scenes at this point. The initial blows can be built toward and described as part of a single scene, the opening of the battle. From that point, and especially after the battle's midpoint, fighting becomes scattered and chaotic, and harder to describe in any clear sense. Herodotus shares scenes of Greek ships chasing down Persian ships, of Greek ships insulting one another as inferior while many of them took turns finishing off men and triremes from among the enemy ranks. A Greek commander transported hoplites from Salamis over to the island of Cytalia, where Persian soldiers, maybe the Egyptians, had been deposited prior to the battle. As the tides turned, the soldiers from Persia there had no way to fall back from the island, so a contingent of Athenian hoplites killed them all and retook the island. Another scene from Herodotus describes the copious amount of wreckage that washed up on the shores of Salamis, pushed there by the west wind in fulfillment of many oracles, to which Herodotus gives a passing nod. What these scenes add up to is a reality that had to have been clear to Xerxes by the afternoon of that day of battle. His decision to engage the Greeks had been a mistake. The Persian line had broken, their strength of numbers had again been turned against them, and the Greek navy that was under a nominal Spartan control had seized victory. As we've outlined, the true credit for this victory should go to Themistocles, 
the smooth operator that made sure battle took place then and there at Salamis. As we listed off some of the scenes that Herodotus shares in his narrative, I mentioned that the Greeks um, slaughtered the troops that Persia had landed on the Isle of Cytalia. And since I've relied a few times on the words of Aeschylus to inject some color to the proceedings, I'd like to do so one final time today. It is with the following scene that Aeschylus wraps up his description of the Battle of Salamis. So it seems appropriate for us to do so also, although we will have some closing commentary after the lines. Aeschylus is writing from a Persian perspective here. When he refers to our bravest, quote, he is referring to Persian soldiers. So then he writes, Full against Salamis an isle arises of small circumference, to the anchored bark unfaithful, On the promontory's brow that overlooks the sea, Pan loves to lead the dance. To this the monarch sends these chiefs, that when the Grecians from their shattered ships should here seek shelter, these might hew them down an easy conquest, and secure the strand to their sea-wearied friends, ill-judging what the event. But when the favoring god to Greece gave the proud glory of this naval fight, Instant in all their glittering arms, they leaped from their light ships, and all the island round encompassed, that our bravest company stood dismayed. While broken rocks whirled with tempestuous force, and storms of arrows crushed them, then the Greeks rushed to the attack at once, and furious spread the carnage, till each mangled Persian fell. Deep were the groans of Xerxes when he saw this havoc, for his seat, a lofty mound commanding the wide sea, o'erlooked his hosts. With rueful cries he rent his royal robes, and through his troops embattled on the shore, gave signal of retreat, then started wild and fled disordered. To the former ills these are fresh miseries to awake thy sighs. I certainly can't argue with that characterization of Persia's defeat at Salamis, a fresh misery on Xerxes' plate. I would say that's a fresh misery indeed. So we know that Persia lost, and at the risk of restating something that we've said many times now, we also know why they lost, at least the broad strokes. Ill preparation Greece's exploitation of the constrained space that they managed to force Persia into, and then their heavier ships in that space. Then also there's the lack of unity amongst the Persian ranks when compared to the Greek ranks. After the Greek ships began to take the upper hand and the Persian line was broken, the latter portions of the day were simply a cleanup operation in the strait. It's mentioned in the ancient texts that Persia's sailors, on balance, didn't know how to swim, so they suffered heavy losses due to drowning, even if the marines or oarsmen managed to survive a ship's sinking and then struggle to stay afloat in the water, maybe struggle to hold on to some piece of wreckage or a body floating there. It was probably a brief struggle in many cases. Although the Persian fleet was broken at the scene of battle, they didn't flee Greece immediately. The Persian army still held the city of Athens and the surrounding regions on the mainland there, so Persia's defeated ships just fled back to Phaleron and to the protection that their land forces could bring to bear there. The Persians that night following their defeat they reassessed their entire game plan. Some accounts portray the Greeks as reveling in a great victory this night, but it's not altogether clear that they even realized the degree to which they had actually won. Herodotus describes them preparing for a renewed battle the next morning. 
It seems that they expected the Persian fleet to still be at Phaleron, and that Persia's ships would want to re-engage the following morning. As we will come to see, that wasn't quite the case. Now, the question arises, if we say that Greece won and Persia lost, how many ships did each side lose? This is, as you might have guessed, a tough question to answer. Neither Herodotus nor Aeschylus even attempt to put figures on the ultimate outcome of this battle at Salamis. They merely describe a Greek victory and a Persian withdrawal. A Roman-era chronicler does give us a figure. We can't verify it with any real certainty, but the figure is realistic rather than outlandish, which is a good sign to start. Many scholars actually agree with the figure that we get here. It puts the Greek losses at around 40 ships lost and the Persian losses at around 200 or so. These numbers are noteworthy, I think, because while losses of these magnitudes in a single battle do indicate a clear winner and a clear loser, we do, of course, have to keep in mind the total ships that each side had at its disposal going into the battle and how those figures progressed throughout the course of the greater war. While Persia was defeated, as we said at Salamis, and they would later withdraw from Greece in a naval sense, her fleet was still probably around 600 ships, maybe slightly higher, even after their defeat at Salamis. Contrast that with Greece, who had around 330, 340 ships to work with after they won a great victory at Salamis. At this point, Persia's fleet was still larger than Greece's. But, as we said, compared with the enormous disparity that had existed between these two fleets at the beginning of the war and at the various battles throughout, it becomes more clear from that perspective that Greece's naval victory at Salamis was the straw that broke the Persian navy's back. Despite the fact that they held a greater force of numbers, they could no longer compete in terms of skill or strategic ability. Their superior numbers could no longer tip the scale, and clearly, they never were able to do so. Now, there is a little bit more to go through to truly wrap up the story of Greece's conflict with Persia, and to wrap up the role that ships and navies played in it. I think that we will do that in our next episode, mainly, and then by the time that we get to episode 40, we will be forging ahead into new territory. The quickest way to put a nice bow on our talk about Salamis is to say that the battle here was not the end of the Greco-Persian War, but it was the battle that gave Greece effective control of the seas in their sphere of the Mediterranean. Xerxes realized this, and in the telling that we have from Herodotus, it was the council of Queen Artemisia again that opened his eyes to the new state of power in the region, and why Greece's dominance of the sea is what was at the core of that power shift. Persia did not immediately withdraw or retreat from Greece, but the bulk of her ship strength did actually withdraw back to the northern Aegean, some to Ionia, and the Phoenicians even went all the way back east to their homeland. Xerxes let one of his subordinate commanders remain in Greece to try and wage a land campaign, but Xerxes surely must have known that he had bigger problems to worry about closer to home. As we will see going forward, victory at Salamis was really the thing that set Greece on the way toward ultimate victory over Persia. That the victory that turned the tide had come at sea with the power of Greece's ships and navy, well, it proved out the vision of the Athenian commander Themistocles, and it made the victory all the sweeter. At least for him, it did. 
As I mentioned a moment ago, when night fell after the battle at Salamis, Greece thought that they would have to fight again the next morning. That didn't prove to be the case, but for now, let's put a pin in the narrative and leave the messy aftermath of battle for our next discussion. Thank you, as always, for tuning in, crew. Um, I greatly appreciate it, and I hope that you got something out of the episode today, or enjoyed it, at least. Now, at the top today, I mentioned that I'm planning to drop a separate, informal episode. In it, I will elaborate a little bit on the absence of episodes for the year 2019. Um, Do look out for that on the horizon in the near future if you're curious about the state of the podcast. But do feel free to skip it. It it won't be in the course of our main historical narrative if that's not something you're concerned about. I don't think it will be a long broadcast um, in any event. It might be slightly rambling, and I guess I'll just give a truncated version of it here. The short version is just that 2019 was a very rough year. I had a lot of personal struggles that I had to work through on many different fronts, some health concerns, some career issues, and then had some health concerns in the extended family too. Those things just pile up at a certain point, and it crowded out my ability to focus on the podcast, which um, was frustrating. There were other things going on um, beneath the surface. Sometimes I do question my suitability for creating a podcast like this, whether it's interesting, whether I can make it engaging. I I don't tend to be a very boisterous person, as you might have noticed. So I hope it's not boring for any of you. I'll try not to question it too much going forward, because I do have a passion and enjoyment for this subject matter. I just need to continue channeling it into a creative process here. And even if I'm rambling into the void, that is completely all right, I guess. I hope that 2020 is the year where I can get back into a groove, and I really do appreciate the encouragement that many of you have shared liberally. And I do apologize for the paucity of episodes in the past. I feel like I've let down the support that many of you have shown. So the goal in 2020 is improved consistency, improved output, that's what I'll focus on. If you have desires or ideas, suggestions, even if you just have a second to say, hey, do let me know what the podcast means to you, what you derive from it personally. Um, Every time I hear from one of you, it is a great boost to me. Um, It's an encouragement. But I do think that this podcast can be a collaborative process and that you as crew, as listeners, can kind of help drive the direction that we choose to point our ship in the future. I appreciate it again today, crew. And until next time, thank you for listening. Fair winds and following seas from me here at the Maritime History Podcast.